facilities have been used from time to time as a polling place for local and national elections. And a few years ago, uh, that was happening. So the entire lobby was set up with uh, little uh, poll, little booths for voting and so forth. And my office at that time was kind of where the library is now. So I walked in one morning when all this was going on, walked through the, um, all the, the, to the polling booths and into my office. And when I came out, uh, there was a gentleman standing there who was evidently supervising the electing the vo voting process. And he saw me walking out of my office, and so he stopped me, and he didn't, I didn't recognize him. He didn't go to this church. So he said, hey, um, are you the pastor here? And I said, well, yes, sir, I am. How can I help you? And he said, and he kind of nodded over his shoulder from the lobby area toward where the sanctuary is, this room, and he went, so what are you doing in there? I went, excuse me? He went, well, I live down the street, and there's cars all, all over the place on Sunday morning, so what are you doing in there? And he sounded kind of frustrated, so I, I thought maybe somebody had parked in his driveway or in front of his yard or something. So I started to apologize. Oh, if somebody parked, I'm sorry. He goes, no, 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 not that. No, I think it's great that so many people are at church on Sunday morning, but I just want to know what you're doing in there. So I did my best to try to explain. Um, and as I look back now, I think that's a good question. What are you doing in there? But I don't think anymore that it's even the best question to ask. We're going to get at that in just a moment. As you know, we're continuing our series from the great New Testament book called Hebrews, Letter to the Hebrews, and we're in chapter 10 today. It's a series called Jesus is Greater Than. So we're going to jump right into chapter 10, and then we'll back up a little bit and try to explain. But chapter 10, verses 19 to 25 is where we begin today. So follow along on the screens or in your Bible, Hebrews 10, beginning in verse 19. Therefore, brothers... Since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Now that was just one sentence. Verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope, Without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now, okay, as we've seen week by week as we go through Hebrews, um, there's a ton of stuff packed into just a few verses here. And so we're going to try to work our way through that here this morning. So... I'm going to read the first part of it again, and I want you to notice the words that I, on purpose this time, have put into red, because it's the, they're where we're going to focus our attention. So beginning in verse 19 again, the author says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he has opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, and I'm going to stop right there. I think if we look at this, the author is actually giving us a brief summary, a very brief summary of the entire first nine chapters that we've already been through. Notice, there are two we haves mentioned back to back here. They're basically a review of what Hebrews has been about so far. Let's look at them first. Since we have confidence to enter the holy places. Now, what would this mean? Remember, Hebrews is written to Jewish background Christians in the latter part of the first century. So what would this phrase mean to Jewish background people living in the first century? Now, we know through understanding the Old Testament uh, that the ancient Jewish people uh, saw access to God, Yahweh, Jehovah, as being extremely limited for them. Uh, I'm going to put some images up here. This is a rendition of what the temple in Jerusalem may have looked like in the first century. That's actually a model uh, of what the temple may have looked like. Now, if you've been to Jerusalem uh, recently, you know that uh, the ancient temple no longer exists. It was, it was destroyed in like 70 AD, so all that's there now is what's called the Temple Mount. So this is the best guess for what, um, and actually this is the next slide, so I'll leave it up, up there. I'll be there in just, oops. Okay, so this is the model. <laughs> That's what's left now. 
And if you've been there, you know that's the remainder of the western retaining wall, just one portion of the retaining wall of the ancient uh, temple site. Now I'm going to show you a schematic that shows you how the temple was set up. <clears throat> this is a little hard to see from where you are, so let me explain. This is like an overhead view of how the whole temple area was constructed. And if you look at that thick black line, that's the walls of the, the, the retaining walls of the temple, the out, outer walls of the, of the temple area. And the court of Gentiles was outside of that. So a Gentile, a non-Jewish person, couldn't even go inside the wall, let alone get into the temple. So the court of Gentiles was outside. Then you would move inside the wall and come to the court of the women, the women could come inside, but couldn't go any nearer than that. And then you would come to the court of the Israelites, which was the court of men. And then you get closer inside that middle line there, and you'd find the court of the priests. And then you would come to the holy place. And that's right at the top, that, the top row, you see all the thick black lines. And then between the holy place and what was called the most holy place, or the holy of holies, was a thick temple. There was a, a thick curtain. There was a curtain that was 60 feet tall, four inches thick, hanging to, that served to protect people from the holiness of God. So what you see is, not only could people not get near the presence of God, they were restricted by a whole series of barriers from getting into the presence of God itself. Now, God himself. Now, in the Holy of Holies, it was a chamber that contained the Ark of the Covenant and what was called the Mercy Seat, and it represented the very presence of God himself. And only the high priest could go into that area, that most holy place, behind the curtain, and he could only do it once a year to make sacrifices for sin. So Hebrews tells us that Jesus has opened a new and living way through his flesh. Matthew 27, uh, following, uh, immediately following the death of Christ on the cross, we read that the curtain, that curtain that separated the holy place from the most holy place was torn in two from top to bottom, some symbolizing that Jesus, through his death, had opened the way forever for us to have fellowship with God. So since we have confidence to enter the most holy places, since we have a great priest, is the second we have. We have a great priest who's made the sacrifice for us, not, no longer through the blood of sheep and goats, not through the blood of animals, repeated over and over again, year after year for the sins of the people, but by his own blood, and not in the earthly temple at all. Remember, it took place in, in heaven itself, where the sacrifice has been offered, so that our sins are covered once and for all. So the author is saying, since we have confidence, since we have a great priest, now what? How should we live? How do we live? What are the implications? Now we're going to get into the heart of the message today, which is three let us passages. Two words, not the, not the vegetable, but three let us passages. I'm going to also put these in red, beginning in verse 22. He says, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. The first thing I want to pull out from this text is let us draw near. Since we have, let us draw near. When I was about 11 years old, and I've told this story a number of times, <clears throat> when I was about 11 years old or so, our family actually lived in a in a parsonage, a uh, fancy word for where a pastor's family lives if it's provided by the church. We lived in a parsonage that was actually connected to the church building. It would be as if we lived in that part of the building and the sanctuary is right here. And our living quarters were separated from the sanctuary by a small office that was my father's, we called it his study. So uh, when that door was shut, between our home and the sanctuary. It meant my father was working in his study and we shouldn't go in there. It was like the Holy of Holies. We shouldn't walk in there. Okay, so one day, um, my brother and I were running around playing or something and, and, and the door was shut, but we were, I didn't think he was in there for some reason. So I just went, just burst, just threw the door open, plowed into his office and ran straight into a pastoral counseling session where my father was deep in conversation with somebody who was sitting with him in his office. 
And I immediately knew that I had entered the most holy place. I was unauthorized. <coughs> and so I stopped dead in my tracks. But before I could escape, my father went. So I walked around his desk, stood there, and then he surprised me. He kind of turned me around and, and introduced me to the person in his study. He said, this is my oldest son, Brian. And I said, hello. And then he turned me around to him and he said, what do you need today, son? What do you need from me today? And I realized, cool, not only am I not in trouble, I think later he probably reminded me to knock before I came into his office, but I realized I had a unique relationship with my father. I had access to him. In a sense, the door of his holy place was always open for me. Now, how sad would it have been if I never took advantage of access to my father? How sad would it have been if I lived my whole life just that far away but never went into his presence? Hebrews says we have access to God through Christ who has opened up the curtain for us. Now what does it mean to draw near to God? What's it mean to draw near to God? I think the first thing that comes to mind for most of us is, well, go to church more. Go to church. Go to, go to church, right? And that's certainly part of it. It's a good thing to come here to be with others in worship. It's a good thing to come to church. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. But we know that God does not live at 2300 South Street. That's the, that's the address of this building. Nor does he live at, at 3435 Kesslinger Road. Nor does he dwell at the Mill Creek campus. We know that. God doesn't live in buildings made by human hands. We know that. To draw near to God isn't to go to a physical place. Now think about it this way. It means to draw, ne draw near means to live in a relationship with God. Now, what is it that helps you draw near to anyone in a human relationship? You know, husband and wife, parent and child, friend and friend. What makes any relationship close? What makes any relationship distant? Well, to be close, first of all, you have to have access to each other, a way of being together. You know, not just Facebook or social media or texting, but a way of being together. Hebrews says Jesus accomplished that for us. He opened the curtain so we have access to God. Secondly, you need safety. If you're fearful of someone, you're not going to draw near to them because you're fearful. And I think many people have a kind of vague fear of God. I mean, I've heard people say, you know, in the context of talking about, hey, um, just join us at church. Somehow. Oh, if I ever came to church, I, there'd be a lightning bolt hit me, you know, if I ever came there. Because you can hear the fear that people have of God. And I think that's a misunderstanding of what the Bible says, of who the Bible says God is. I mean, I, if I think about my own family, as a father, I don't want my boys to be fearful of me, to be afraid to draw near, even if they've done something like, I could talk for a while right now, but the time like they were playing football in the driveway and they threw a ball and it hit one of our decorative, one of those big decorative uh, uh, lights on our garage, you know, the real fancy ones, broke it right off the wall of the, of the house, just dangling there. And I wasn't home, so they scrambled around, they found a bunch of duct tape, and they duct taped <laughs> the light back to the side of the house. So, and I never noticed. <laughs> For weeks I didn't notice. And then even to this day, it's wired up there because I'm too cheap to buy another one. Or the time when I went into our basement, after we just refinished all the drywall, finished our basement, I went in our basement and there was a perfectly round baseball-sized hole in the drywall. Perfect, I could fit a baseball right in there. And no one knew how it happened. <laughs> no one had any idea. So even if that happens, I don't want them to fear coming to me. I don't want them to fear that. We don't have to fear going closer to God. 
Thirdly, in a close relationship, you have to spend time together. You talk to each other, and you listen to each other. You do things together. You enjoy each other's presence. So, how do we draw near to God? Notice, there are four things in this one verse. I'm going to put them all in red. Verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart. That's the first. In full assurance of faith. That's the second. With hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. And with our bodies washed with pure water. First, draw near with a true heart. Now, what's a true heart? If you look up those words, a true heart is a sincere heart, a genuine heart. Just as there's no real human relationship without some degree of openness and vulnerability and honesty, so also we can only draw near to God with open and honest hearts. Now, I think the author has in mind here, most likely, prayer. But not prayer, I think, as we often think of prayer. Often, I think, we think of prayer as a kind of of ritual, a kind of religious duty. Prayers that we're taught to recite in church, or at bedtime, or at mealtimes. Or maybe we think of prayer as a kind of of religious performance. I've often... um, had the experience of being at someone's home for a a cookout or a party, and uh, time comes to have the meal, and everybody sort of stops and looks at me. Like like it needs to be done by a professional, like the prayer has to be professional. And often, just for fun, because I know that's what's going on, I'll say, oh, I'm sorry, it's Saturday, I'm off duty today. (laughs) And everybody looks, the whole, everybody's panicked, oh, if he's not going to do it, who's going to do it? Like, Like, it has to be done right. I think people are fearful insecure. Maybe they're not doing it the right way. I imagine a child coming to Father. Oh, most high and holy Father, thou who art supreme above all things, I beseech thee, Father, please can I have a bowl of ice cream? No, that, that's not what prayer is about. He's talking about prayer is simply opening our hearts, opening our hearts to God in honesty. See, I think we sometimes reduce prayer. I know I've done this. For whole long periods of time, reduce prayer to kind of like a shopping list or uh, five minutes of quiet time in the morning. And now those aren't bad things. Our God wants us to ask Him as children for our needs. He wants to spend time with us. But just think about this. Think if we tried to do marriage like that. Let's say I wake up and tell my wife she can have the first five minutes of my day. All hers, five minutes. After that, I kind of I got other things to do after those five minutes. Or let's say every day I just leave a, long, leave a list uh, uh, on her side of the bed. This is kind of what I need from you today. There it is. That's not drawing near. Prayer is a relationship. It's intimate. It's honest. It's a two-way conversation with one who knows us and loves us completely. And it begins with a true heart. Secondly, We draw near in full assurance of faith. Earlier in Hebrews chapter 4, we read this. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We can approach God with bold confidence. Now, usually I think we think of confidence almost instinctively as self-confidence. Right? Self-confidence. I saw an interview... uh, Oh, a couple of years ago with the basketball superstar LeBron James was in a press conference. And some reporter asked him if he was ever nervous or anxious before a game. And he said, uh, no. And the reporter followed up and said, well, why? He said, because I'm the greatest player in the world. And it was a brutally honest answer. That's self-confidence. That's bold self-confidence. And that's how we think of confidence. But the Bible says we approach God with confidence not because we're, you know, really kind of awesome in ourselves, or not because we're holy, not because we have this big stack of good deeds we can sort of shove his way and say, look how good we are, but because faith in what Jesus has done. He is the one who's done for us what we cannot do for ourselves because he went behind the curtain and opened the way. Thirdly, we draw near with hearts sprinkled clean. That's a little bit foreign to us, but it was a reference to what Jewish background believers would have immediately understood as 
looking back toward the Old Testament system of sacrifices, when the blood was shed from a sacrificial animal and then sprinkled on the altar or on the mercy seat to cover the sins of the people. We need not fear God because through the blood of Christ we are sprinkled clean. And then lastly, the fourth thing is draw near with bodies washed in pure water. Also a little strange to us, but most likely means refers both to the ancient Jewish ritual traditions of bodily cleansings before coming to God, now replaced by the Christian practice of baptism, which is symbolic of how Christ washes us clean from sins through his blood. So, let us draw near, he says first. And secondly, he says, let us hold fast. Since we have one who's gone before us to open the way, let us draw near and let us hold fast. When I went to college, at least the first time, I went to Davidson College in North Carolina. Davidson was a very, very small town, like a one-stoplight town in rural North Carolina. And there was an ancient water tower in town. This isn't that one, but it looked a lot like this. So, um, inevitably, it was some, something of a tradition for Davidson College students to climb that water tower once before graduation, even though there were all kinds of signs around it that do not climb the water tower, but it was kind of a tradition. So one night, my senior year, a bunch of my friends decided that that was the night, that they were going to climb this water tower. I was with them, but I wasn't very enthusiastic about that whole deal because I really don't like heights at all. I wouldn't say I'm necessarily phobic, but I, I'm pretty close to that. I don't, I don't like heights. I don't even like climbing up on a ladder, let alone that thing. Uh, but they were all fired up, and everybody was going to do it, and so, you know, Peer pressure is a powerful thing, so I wound up in the group, and we're, uh, we climb up one of the legs of that tower, and the tower's over 100 feet tall, and the little ladder's on the outside of one of those legs, so we're climbing up. I get about 20 feet up, and I think to myself, what am I doing? I am not doing this. I was terrified. But I looked behind, underneath me, and there were some of our friends who were girls were climbing up behind me, <laughs> and there was no way I was going to say, hey, would you please go down? I just can't do this. I was really stuck, so I kept going against all my instincts, finished the climb all the way to the top, somehow got down safely. But the next day, the next day my hands were so sore, I, couldn't, I didn't, couldn't figure out why. My arms were, I could almost not move my arms, and I had big bruises, ugly purple bruises on both my shins. I'm thinking, what happened? What did I do? Turns out, I figured it out. I was hanging on so tight to that ladder gripping it, that I made myself sore, and my legs were shaking against the ladder so hard I bruised myself, okay? I hung on so tight because I was fearful. I was terrified, but because that ladder was also my hope, right? That ladder was my hope. Verse 23 says, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Now, the word translated to hold fast means to grip tightly, to hold resolutely, unswervingly. But what are we to hold on to? He says the confession of our hope. What's that? Well, a few weeks ago, actually last week, we looked at Hebrews chapter, a couple weeks ago, we looked at chapter 6, verse 19, that says, we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner. So Jesus is the hope that anchors our souls, and the hope of Jesus is the promise of an eternal inheritance. Last week, chapter 9. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. And what's that? 1 Peter chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. So, Jesus is our hope because he's opened the way to God. He has made us clean, and his promise is one of eternal inheritance. Now, this is important. Our hope is not, is not in deliverance now, healing now now. More comfortable life now. Those are all good things, and we can ask for that. But that's not where our hope is anchored. The author doesn't say, Jesus promises that the Roman emperor will stop being mean to you people. 
He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, no more persecution for you. He says, no, our hope is in a promised eternal inheritance. Our confession is the gospel. Now, why does he say then, hold fast? Because life is scary and hard. And there are forces trying to rip that hope out of our hands. These Jewish background believers were facing a terrible time of suffering. They're tempted to let go, to give up, to go back. He says, no, hang on. But here's the thing. It's not just hardship that threatens our hope. We aren't living at that kind of time now. But we face an even greater risk to our hope. Sometimes greater risk. And that is, we live in a culture of comfort. We live in a culture of material plenty that tells us our hope is somewhere else altogether. We live in a culture that constantly eats away at our confession. And I think particularly of our students. I've talked about this before. I think of our students, our younger people, bombarded by messages day after day after day that tell them their faith is hopeless. Their faith is old-fashioned. Their faith is foolish. Their faith is imaginary. The writer of Hebrews says, hold fast. Grip tightly the truth of Christ, the promise of Christ, and the hope of Christ. And then thirdly, we see, let us consider. Let us consider, verse 24, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Now, I want you to see something here. He does not say, let us consider how to love and do good works. That's often what we assume he's saying. But he's not saying it exactly that way. He says, let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works. Completely different dynamic. To stir up means to prod, to provoke, to poke with something sharp. Okay? Now, before we go on, notice this too. Our confession comes first. First, we hold fast to our confession. That's our faith. Then, we stir each other up. That's our actions, how we live. We don't do good things in order to get God to save us. God saves us in order to do good things. That's the gospel. So let's put it all together. He says, consider, think carefully, pay attention, try to understand how to stir up each other to love and good works. Now, some of this happens right here when we're all together in our weekend worship services. For 2,000 years now, followers of Jesus have gathered together on the Lord's Day to worship, to proclaim God's Word, and to pray. So some of the stirring up happens here, but not all, I don't think. Because the author says, consider how to stir up one another. Right here, it's one person stirring up many. Okay? This means that I think if the sum total of your spiritual life is sitting here for 60 minutes on Sunday morning listening to someone at a pulpit stir you up, you've only experienced about half of what God really intends for you. The author continues, verse 25, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Not neglecting to meet together. Now, it would be easy for me here just to talk about uh, Sunday worship, <coughs> excuse me, Sunday worship attendance, how often people go to church. Did you know that churches all over America are seeing the same pattern over the past 15 to 20 years? That is, simply put, people are going to church, going to worship services less often than they ever have before, really in the history of the church in North America. For example, 20 years ago, uh, your com the committed people committed to a church family would be in church on a Sunday three out of four or four out of four Sundays a month. Uh, be, be fair, three out of four for the course of a whole year. Today, just 20 years later, it's between one and two Sundays a month for your most committed people on average. Meaning that on any given weekend, 60% of the people who call this their church home are doing something else. Let me say that again. On any given weekend, 60% of the people who call this their church home 
are simply doing something else. Now, there's lots of reasons for that, for this shift. Cultural pressure, pace of life, demands of work, kids' activities. And to be honest, we have participated because we've created lots of ways to stay connected to your church without being here on a Sunday morning. You can hear sermons online, you can give online, you miss a Sunday, you don't miss as much as you used to 20 years ago. I get all that. So it would be easy for me to say, don't neglect. And that would be true and important. But I don't think that's everything the author here is talking about. I don't even think it's maybe the most important thing he's talking about. Because I think he's talking not necessarily about what we do when we're in here, but what we, what we do when we're out there. I think he's talking about our tendency to think we can do this thing called faith, the Christian life, by ourselves. I think he's saying that we need each other, we need each other's encouragement to be what God intends. Essentially, I think he's saying that faith for a believer is, for lack of a better term, a team sport. It's a team thing. It's a family thing. I was listening to a pastor online, a guy I kind of learned I liked listening to. His name is Jason Lim. He's a pastor in Singapore, interestingly enough, but a very good uh, preacher. He used a really simple line in talking about this passage. Really simple, but it struck me, and I kept thinking about it. He said, what he's saying here is that you need others, and others need you. You need others, and others need you. It means that God has so designed us and his church that we have the power and responsibility to encourage one another, to poke and stir each other up. And this happens maybe not so much on Sunday morning, but Monday through Saturday in relationships, in homes, in family rooms, in Bible study groups, in small groups, in book club groups. And it means that when I neglect that aspect of my faith, when I think I can just do faith on my own and everybody else can do it on their own, I'm actually neglecting someone that may need my encouragement. In essence, it means I'm kind of a bad teammate. Pastor and author Francis Chan writes, God calls you to be the church, not just sit in a room and listen to a sermon. That's pretty good. God calls you to be the church, not just sit in the room and listen to a sermon. So, back to the question I started with. The guy who stopped me in the lobby years ago and said, what are you doing in there? It's a good question. It's one we need to think about, and we do think about quite often. But it may not be the best question. Or certainly not the only question. Because the church is not just what we do in here. The church is who we are and what we do out there. Isn't that true? So the question is, what are we doing? What are you doing out there? Who are you encouraging out there? Who are you poking and stirring up to do good works and to love the world out there? What does our faith look like out there? We are to draw near to God. We are to hold fast our confession. We are to stir each other up and encourage each other to love and good works out there. Would you bow with me as I close today? Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that because of what you did for us. Because of your sacrifice, we can draw near without fear to God. We can live in relationship with you. Strengthen us to hold fast to our confession, to grip it tightly, and remind us that we are not alone, that we need each other to stir up and encourage. And may we be your church in the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just before the benediction, if you were not able to finish your little survey card, there wasn't room in the plate for it, just take it out to the Welcome Center and drop it off out there in the lobby. Thank you so much for that. Receive now the benediction. May we go now in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is 
our new and living way and who gives us confidence that we may draw near to the living God. Amen. Have a great day.